30-year-old trainee pilot Anthony Thrower of Lavinia Street, Granville was making his second approach of the day when something went wrong. As he prepared to touch down, his rented J4 Archer's engine sputtered and died. Fortunately for Tony, his training kicked in and he successfully glided the now powerless Archer down the final 10 feet and landed gently on the tarmac. Jumping down, he decided to try and give the propeller a spin to see if the engine would restart. It was a crisp, clear winter morning and it seemed a shame to waste it. He applied the brakes, then jumped down and gave the prop a good old spin. The Blackburn Cirrus Major spluttered and roared into life, with such vigour that the Archer escaped its brakes and began to trundle down the runway. Tony grabbed onto the Archer's wing strut and attempted to wrestle the 700 kilo machine back to a standstill. But the Archer had been quietly tolerating wannabe pilots for years. Today was the final straw and it was in determined mood. It accelerated away and Tony was forced to let go of the strut to prevent a painful fall. As he ran off towards the tower to warn them of the runaway trainer careening around their taxiway, Tony looked back over his shoulder and was shocked to see the Archer chasing him. He dove off the grass as the little plane accelerated past and then to his horror began to slowly, gracefully, lift its small wheels off the tarmac and take to the air, heading now directly for Bankstown's control tower, 15 feet off the ground and climbing slowly. Thankfully, before he could shout a warning, a gust of wind took the archer narrowly past the building into a sharp bank, which eventually led it back around the field. A minute later, it whizzed past the tower again, in a move that would later be memorialised by Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Levelling out, it headed directly for the sprawling suburbs of Sydney. It was shortly after 08.30 that the tower called the Royal Australian Air Force, assuming that they would know what to do about it. This was, it turned out, an optimistic assessment of the RAAF's readiness for, and proficiency in, air-to-air combat. The operation, sadly not called Unable Archer, started well enough. As it happened, a Royal Australian Navy Oster autocar, a very close cousin of the Archer, from Naval Air Station Nowra, was making its way to nearby Schofield's aerodrome, and the pilot, a Commander J. Groves, offered to trail the runaway Oster, which was heading across town towards Sydney's CBD. Neither the Archer, nor the more common autocar and Arrow, were what one might call high-performance aircraft. An Archer is an Oster Arrow high-wing touring monoplane fitted with a 90-horsepower Blackburn Cirrus Minor in place of the latter's American Lycoming engine, which was unavailable for a time due to post-war import restrictions. The autocar was basically the same, but it had four seats rather than two and a more powerful engine. The Archer's maximum speed was a sedate 108 miles an hour. The autocar was faster, 130 miles an hour flat out. It was, however, unarmed, so there was nothing Groves could do but observe. Shortly thereafter, altogether more serious support arrived in the shape of a pair of brand new CAC Sabres, the most capable aircraft available to the RAAF at the time. Unfortunately, the two Sabres had been on a training mission and weren't carrying any ammunition for their two 30mm Aiden cannons, so instead they hung out, looking cool and menacing as they orbited. With agents on the scene assessing the strength and intentions of their opponent, the RAAF leadership hurriedly selected a course of action. Clearly the Archer, loaded with fuel and flying at some altitude, couldn't be allowed to pass over populated areas. That was too risky, even for Australians in 1955. The fugitive would therefore have to be brought down in a controlled manner. The problem that now presented itself was that it was a slow news day in Sydney on August 30th, 1955, Tens of thousands of their fellow citizens were eagerly scanning the skies while radio stations provided a minute-to-minute play-by-play. Now as a Brit, and a Londoner, I reckon I know a thing or two about Australians. Most of these things have been, or are about to be used, as stereotypes in this video. Foremost amongst these questionable facts is that Australians love sport. I know this because they generally beat us at all sports. Given that it wasn't a very interesting day, and that they had had many potential entertainments to offer, the RAAF apparently decided that rather than send an actual fighter to down the archer, they'd send two blokes in a wirraway and thus give the people a show. The two blokes in question were Wing Commander Beatty and Squadron Leader Janes. Senior ranks get all the plum jobs. Having received the call at Richmond Air Air Station, Beatty and Janes set about preparing for their mission. Recognising that the favoured Australian defensive weapon, a large knife, would be ineffectual due to range, Beatty and Janes briefly pondered what would provide them with a sporting, but very slight chance of downing another aircraft. Contemplation complete, they approached the base armourer and procured a Bren gun. 
Thus armed, the two aviators come sportsmen climbed into the Wirraway and took off in pursuit of the errant archer. Perhaps sensing their approach, the archer took this opportunity to turn into the wind and climb to 9,000 feet. In doing so, it slowed to around 60 knots, drifting slowly over Manly and then turning north towards, towards Palm Beach. At this point, Commander Groves prudently left the area, assuming, possibly correctly, that Beatty and Janes might mistake him for the runaway. Some of you might be wondering what the blazes of Wirraway is. It's actually quite an interesting story in its own right. In the mid-1930s, the Australian government realised that war with Japan was likely an inevitability. Significant rearmament would be needed, including modernisation of the RAAF. Alongside this programme, it made sense to develop a domestic aircraft industry to re- reduce their reliance on suppliers 10,000 kilometres away. But recognising this was a big ask, the planners sensibly elected to licence a foreign design in order to get things going. They also sensibly rejected the temptation to licence a top-of-the-line fighter like the then-proposed Spitfire, which might have proved too complicated to actually build from a standing start. Instead, they focused on an advanced monoplane trainer with secondary combat capabilities. The design they selected was the North American NR-16, powered by a licence-built Pratt & Whitney R1340 Wasp engine of 600 horsepower, and this became the Wirraway. Although its performance was very modest, being capable of only 220 miles an hour flat out, 755 were built in seven variants between 1939 and 1942. They served across the Pacific Theatre, but by 1943 had been reduced to trainers, as more capable types had entered service. Most RAF squadrons retained one, however, to serve as squadron hack. In a curious coincidence, on the 12th of December 1942, a pilot named J.S. Archer spotted a Japanese KI-43 300 metres below him. He dived on it, opened fire, and sent it hurtling into the sea. This was the Wirraway's only kill of the war, and as circumstances were about to go against it, ever. Its lack of dynamic performance actually made the Wirraway a pretty good choice for hunting the archer. The pedestrian fighter's stall speed is only 50 miles an hour. Beatty and Janes positioned themselves and slid open the cockpit. Janes took careful aim and then let fly a burst from the Bren gun. Before I make this story seem like Janes was a poor shot or otherwise incompetent, I should be clear at this moment. A Bren gun is not an effective air-to-air weapon under any circumstances, even shooting at a slow-moving, unpiloted aeroplane from close range. To illustrate this, I am now going to put a whole lot of photographs of people trying to use Bren guns as anti-air weapons in front of you. For starters, the Bren gun lacks a proper mount in air-to-air use. Don't imagine a Lewis gun in World War I. Jane's propped it on the sill of the cockpit with the freezing wind whipping around him. The Bren gun also has a pretty slow rate of fire for air-to-air use. About 500 rounds a minute, so about 8 rounds a second. That's decent if you're using it for suppressing fire as an infantryman, but a bit thin for air-to-air. To give you a comparison, that's less than that of the MiG-15's 23mm cannons which are widely regarded as too slow firing for a fighter. If you don't believe me, have a read of the comments in my previous videos. The final issue with the Bren gun, in case you find yourself in a situation in which you need to shoot down a runaway light aircraft, is that the 303 round doesn't have enough mass to cause a crippling hit. 303 is a 14 gram round. A Sabre's 50 caliber uses 49 gram bullets. The 30mm Aiden cannon that the CAC Sabres had brought to the party fired shells that weigh 199 grams, of which 52 grams is explosive. They'd have torn the archer apart if they'd been loaded. Having fired the first magazine to no visible effect, Jane's attempted to change the Bren gun's 30 round box magazine, but his gloved hands were freezing in the high altitude winter air and he couldn't get the magazine seated. Thus defeated, and with their fuel running low, Beatty and Jane's returned to base while their commanders went back to the drawing board. The Sabres also departed, having attempted and accomplished nothing more than looking dynamic and cool in the absence of danger. The RAF higher-ups decided that it was now time to get serious. They called Williamtown Air Force Base and told them to send its meteors to deal with the problem once and for all. Duly instructed, two Meteor F-8s scrambled to intercept. One of these was a regular F-8, armed with 420mm cannons, the other unarmed except for cameras to record their glorious victory. The pair covered the 150 kilometres or so in about 10 minutes. The armed aircraft was piloted by squadron leader Holdsworth. Plum jobs for the leaders again. Sadly, I can't find any record of the name of the other Meteor pilot, and one source suggests that there actually wasn't one, which would solve the mystery entirely. But if you know for sure, please leave me a comment. 
The Archer's slow speed was clearly going to be an issue for the heavy jet-powered Meteor, although contemporary flight tested observed it was a well-behaved aircraft that presented no problems in the stall. Derek Dempster tested the F-8 for the May 11th, 1951 issue of the aeroplane and had this to say about its low speed performance. Warning of the approach of the stall is given by slight elevator buffering. Warning of the approach of the stall is given by a slight elevator buffeting some 10 knots before it occurs. This becomes more pronounced as the stall approaches and slight fore and aft pitching is accompanied by vibration. At the end of the stall, which occurs at 100 knots indicated, the aircraft wallows and does not seem to want to drop its nose. It does go down eventually after a little persistent hauling on the control column. Either wing may drop, but not very much. So flying as slowly as he dared, Holdsworth lined up for a firing pass from 6 o'clock, with the other meteor on his wing to record events. Perfectly set up, he thumbed the fire button. The cannons roared, letting go 10 rounds in half a second, and then jammed solid. Irritated, Holdsworth dropped back and tried again still jammed. So on his third pass he tried something different, roaring past at full throttle in an attempt to knock the little Sunday plane down with his jet wash. But having spent the best part of a decade putting up with trainees kangarooing it around the sky, the archer resolutely ignored him. Powerless and now running low on fuel, the meteor pilots swung their jets around and headed back to Williamtown. Holdsworth claimed several hits that obviously didn't occur. As was about to be demonstrated, 20mm cannon rounds make a healthy mess of a civilian tourer. The RAAF commanders ordered another pair of meteors into the fight. But the story was about to take a twist. At the Royal Australian Navy Air Station at Nowra, south of Sydney, two Sea Furies had returned to base after firing rockets at Beecroft Range. The Sea Furies from 805 Squadron were piloted by two British Fleet Air Arm Lieutenants, Peter McNay and John Blewett. Both of their aircraft were quickly loaded with 20mm ammunition and the pilots were told to fly to Sydney. The Sea Fury is one of, the, of several outstanding piston engine fighters that came along at the end of World War II. Unfortunately, the development of jets like the Meteor and soon after the MiG-15 and the Sabre meant that its career was essentially over before it had begun, but it didn't stop the Sea Fury being an excellent, manoeuvrable, fast and hell of a heavily armed aircraft. In fact, I'd say there's a reasonable case to be made for the Sea Fury being the best piston engine fighter of all time. It was also a carrier aircraft, a fact that endowed it with excellent slow speed handling characteristics. McNay and Blewett had both flown the Sea Fury in combat over Korea. They were not the sort of aviators to mess about when things needed to be taken care of. Flying north, the two Ran Sea Furies arrived on the scene at 11.35, shortly after the meteors broke off their engagement. As a precaution to ensure the arch was empty, McNay lowered his flaps and undercarriage to check inside the cabin, as in the media fuel furore, report had been received that a schoolboy might be on board. Ensuring that it was empty, McNay repositioned his Sea Fury behind the archer, which was now flying at about 10,000 feet and some distance out to sea. He fired a short burst from his 20mm cannon, hitting the archer and knocking it out of a turn. Blew it in the other Sea Fury, then fired from a beam on position, causing the archer's cockpit to burst into flames. Badly damaged, the archer nosed down into a slow spiral. McNay followed with another burst from his cannons, sending the delinquent crashing into the sea off Broken Bay at 11.42am. Just to rub the RAAF's nose in it, the two victorious lieutenants were ordered to put down at Sydney International Airport to meet the press and pose for photos, before returning to Nowra. Ground crew painted a yellow archer silhouette under the cockpit of VW645 to mark their victory. The Battle of Sydney was over. The recriminations were just starting. Australia's Defence Minister faced questions as to why it took more than two and a half hours, six frontline fighters and two blokes with a Bren gun to shoot down an unarmed, slow-moving civilian aircraft. On the other side of the world, the US Air Defence Command read the news articles from Sydney with interest. Debacle, they thought to themselves. That's not a debacle. Hold our beers and watch this. Papers were written. Technology was developed. A Hellcat was prepared. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It was certainly an interesting and fun one to record. Um, before I go, I'd just uh, like to say thank you to Brian Wheeler 1608, who was the uh, commenter who put me on to this one. Uh, Brian Wheeler 1608, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, found it as interesting as I did. Um, if you, as ever, if you've got any comments, please do leave them. I really enjoy reading them um, and I will see you again very soon.